to know, arthroscopic shoulder and elbow techniques, advanced techniques. We have, as I said, top of the line uh, scientists and surgeons together with us today. Sergio, uh, we must also introduce uh, Gaston Magnon, that was the co-president. We were together in, in that project of the Congress and the president of the International Board of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, Dr. Osvan Rele. So Gaston, if you want to say some words about that Congress, or what do you remember or hide, want to highlight about this? Uh, you need uh, to unmute. Well, Daniel, uh, it's really a great pleasure to be all together once again. Uh, as I said, when we, we were in the 14th International Congress in Buenos Aires, we start working with Daniel in 2007. And it takes a lot of time to get where we get. So uh, we're very proud what we did and especially because we can put together many people from all over the world, around 2,000 people there. We enjoy it, really. Uh, we work hard for that, but we feel very good when we finish our Congress. Sure. Uh, it was very important for us, especially for Argentina, that we can make this type of Congress. And we were very supported by the Asociación Argentina de Hombre Codo, our, our association in Buenos Aires, the Latin American Association, and all the associations around the world. And a special thank to Osvander, my friend. He worked very hard, and uh, many people work there. We have our committee, and we work since 2010 and and we did it i think quite good but the main thing was that we did what we were planning to do and we finally we can make it we feel very proud that we can do that congress and now looking forward to see you all in 2023 in rome thank you daniel and thank you all Osvandre, uh, welcome. Well, friends, friends from around the world. Today I'm wearing this hat. And this means in honor of our last meeting, exactly two years ago in Buenos Aires. Thanks to Marcelo Villa, Gonzalo Gomez, uh, Gaston and Adriana, and Daniel and Emilci and a big group that organized the wonderful meeting. International Board of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery uh, was established in 1992. Uh, it's been a long time ago from Dr. Charles Neer, together with the leaders of that time as uh, Marty Vastamaki, Hiro Fukuda, Charles Rockwood, uh, Angus Wallace and others. And since then, the International Board is responsible for the International Congress that take place every three years around the globe. All these friends here that will be talking to you today are involved in teaching in this international meeting. And we are very thankful for them today. Uh, the International Board uh, this time is uh, uh, have the following members, Evan Fleto, Jin Yung Park, Alex Castanha, Stefano Gumina, Emilio Calvo, Joe Iannotti, Daniel and Gaston, Naoki Suenaga, Steve Roche, and Craig Ball. So the whole all continents are represented in this international board. And we are dealing since the beginning of the pandemic of COVID with the, our next meeting. And uh, companies didn't work 
didn't want to participate because the restrictions, sanitary restrictions, uh, the older population still didn't have vaccinations uh, for the, uh, to be able to travel. So the international board and the organizers of the next meeting in Rome have agreed to postpone one year from 22 to 23. And also thanks to the uh, comprehension of our North American friends, the Vancouver meeting, which was scheduled to 25, has moved to 26. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that Giovanni will tell us some information about the Rome meeting. Thank you very much and have a great webinar. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, my friends. I just want that you keep in mind that in Rome at the end of August and the first week of September in 2023 will take place the 15th international meeting of our society, the seventh meeting of the physiotherapist. And I think that the joining of us and us with the physiotherapist is one of the key points because personally I think that communication with physiotherapists besides between surgeons is uh, very important. So I am proud to stay in Rome now and proud to be part of our society and we are waiting for you. You are very welcome in Rome. Lovely. Thank you very much Giovanni. Uh, we will begin with the talks. Uh, Sergio, if you want to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Yes, so hello everybody. I'm Dr. Sergio Rovinsky from Sao Paulo, Brazil, from Show the Planet. It's a pleasure to be uh, here and it's a pleasure to be working with Dr. Daniel for two years now. And I thank you, Daniel, from the bottom of my heart. So we will start with the lecture of Dr. Giovanni Di Giacomo who's gonna talk about risk factors in Latarge clinical results. Dr. Giovanni, you can start, please, sir. Thank you very much. And please give me a confirmation that uh, I really think uh, is uh, working with the computer. Okay. It's working, sir. Perfect, great. So my goal is uh, to speak about um, surgical and clinical risk factor when we treat uh, patients with the Latarge technique. We know that there is a classification that should be, but not completely, a cutting age between bunker repair, I mean the on-track lesion, and the main indication, but not the only one, for the Latarge technique that are the off-track lesion. I always um, enjoy to remember that an off-track lesion may be because there is a bipolar, uh, bone loss, but also because there is a very lateralized heel sacs. Remember that the more heel sacs is uh, medial, the more possibility you have, like you can see in this video, the heel sacs is going to be enlarged medially, can engage. So in our practice, the main indication, but not the only one for off-track lesion are, for the latage are the off-track lesion. So for the bipolar lesion. Uh, Latarche works because we improve the bone platform, because some surgeon fix the capsula. I don't do this uh, very often, but very, very important is, so, is also the muscle effect of the inferior part of the subscalp and of the common tendon. Patients who present failed Latarche, the main complaints are recurrent instability, but not only instability, maybe unremitting pain on shoulder stiffness. The key issue is potential mechanism of re-injury. You have to consider technical pitfalls, and we will pay some minutes on this. Previous surgical treatment, neurologic assessment is a very important. And another key point may be the persistent symptoms that were present before the surgery. 84% of the vision cases are because mild diagnosis for concomitant pathology. This is very, very important. Diagnosis of failed Latarche procedure, as always, because uh, with history, complete examination and imaging. And um, we can have three different scenarios. One 
is you can have a recurrence or clinical failure because a new trauma. And of course, we, in, in this case, we cannot, nothing is a, a unlucky patient. But very, very interesting are the two other points. One are the te technical pitfalls. First of all, you have to be able to remove the right side of the coracoid. So you have to perform the osteotomy in front of the conoid and trapezoid ligament at level of the knee of the coracoid. Then we have to debride the deepest part of the coracoid that will match with the glenoid. And very, very important is the split of the subscalp. I think that the split is one of the key points instead of tenotomy. This is, of course, the right shoulder, and the galpi are showing very well, very well the plane between the suit cap and the inferior capsula. We don't like to do a tenotomy because we consider this like a iatrogenic damage, but we think that the split in the right position, usually between two thirds superior and one third inferior, is the key point, and this give an excellent access to the glenohumeral joint. When you perform the split. Don't stay too medial because the nerve, but don't stay too much lateral because you can cause a iatrogenic lesion to the biceps tendon. Then always in the right shoulder, the capsulotomy, we do this from in the right shoulder from lateral to medial, from west to east to have a good view of the glenohumeral joint. This is the perfect view in our experience. The position of the coracoid is one of the key points that can lead to a failure. We don't want that the coracoid is a superior or too much inferior, like in this case. Also, the position in medial laterals, we want that it match, the coracoid match with the glenoid, or at least one millimeter, but medial, never lateral for the arthritis. And very, very important, and you have to consider that sometimes we perform the latage when there is a no huge glenoid bone loss. And if you perform the latage technique, with a minimal or subcritical glenoid bone loss, you have to pay attention to the medial contact of the coracoid. Because the less bone loss you have, the steeper is uh, the glenoid. The best situation is when you have a, a glenoid bone loss that is uh, between 13 and 25, that is a huge glenoid bone loss, and the surgery led to do a very good match between the inferior part of the coracoid and the glenoid. Otherwise, you can have an osteolysis on the medial part and iatrogenic lesion of the screw. So always look and pay attention to the medial part of the coracoid when you are placing the coracoid. Otherwise, something like this can happen. Because remember that this, uh, the space, uh, the surgical space is very, very small, is very, very deep. And of course, we cannot uh, give a look to the interface between the deep neck and the inferior part of the glenoid. We spent some paper on this and we realized that the best position of the coracoid for biomechanical and biological issue is exactly where the bone loss is. And we to try to fix uh, the part of the uh, coracoid that is close to the tendon because the best vascularity exactly where the bone loss is to have the best mechanics. We call this mechanotransduction and this is a classical view of a very good results after two years of the patient. This is a, not a complication. This is a normal biomechanics according to the world flu. My, misdiagnosis can be another cause of uh, failure. And uh, I always remember that failure is not only recurrence, but may be a clinical failure with a very high rosy or no good salad. And we did uh, a study on more than 300 patients and it's interesting that other authors, like our friend Giuseppe Porcellini, he did the same paper, but on arthroscopic uh, but latage, looking which could be the preoperative risk factors that can lead to recurrence of clinical failure. In bunker, sex, age, elapsed time seems to be at risk. Race, bilateral, age, and number of dislocation are risk factor. And so there are many publications that try uh, to help the surgeon to individuate those patients that could have a not good results after arthroscopic bunker repair. Looking at the latter share, the risk factor that we try to study were sex, age at the first dislocation, 
dominant versus non-dominant. Mechanism on the dislocation is very important. Unilateral versus bilateral is one of the most interesting part. Duration, it means elapsed time. Preoperative dislocation, the number. Characterization of bipolar on track versus off track. And age at surgery. This is some statistics. I don't want to bother you. This is the final results. X factor that we can check before the surgery, before the Latage procedure, are a traumatic mechanism of primary dislocation. I want to focus the attention always, and I do this every day, on the mechanism of the lesion in first time dislocation. And for me, when it's atraumatic, anterior inferior is a red flag, not only for Latage, but of course also for bunker repair. Bilateral is another independent factor. Bilateral shoulder instability lead to four time risk of recurrence. A traumatic to five risk times of recurrence. Patients with bilateral shoulder instability were five times more likely to experience this time clinical failure and female three times greater clinical failure. So I think that uh, what means bilateral, what means atraumatic? There is something that the studies, uh, we, we, we need to improve our knowledge of something that uh, we don't know exactly very well in this moment of the shoulder instability history. Maybe something genetic profile, like yeah. of course uh, the version of the glenoid or some concomitant uh, uh, laxity. So in conclusion, risk factor before Latage are bilateral shoulder instability, automatic mechanism and female. Thank you. Nice. Uh, Giovanni, ec yeah. excellent exposition, thanks. Uh, do you have a better solution for the uh, atraumatic young multidirectional patients that, that keep uh, dislocating? At this uh, point, no, I, did some, I would like to say yes, but I don't have any um, excellent solution. You know that the first thing that I stress is that the rehabilitation. Sure. I think the rehabilitation is at the key point. And sometimes this, I don't know in your country, this could be interesting, but in Italy, in Rome, there is the fashion of modalities. And I don't want to say that modalities doesn't work, but it's not a key point. In this kind of a pathology, I think very important is to reinforce the core, to give core stability, and to study, to improve the scapulothoracic motion. Because sure. there is a close correlation between scapulothoracic dyskinesia and uh, uh, multidirectional instability. And sure. you know that uh, Philippe Morode developed something uh, that we call a pacemaker, uh, that could help in the proprioception neuromuscular control. Sure, Regarding sure. the surgery, I can say because uh, is uh, the step that I try to avoid, but sometimes, of course, we do. Johnny, question for you. Uh, the question would be: Some choose to uh, repair capsule with their ladder J's, and some choose not. This is a perfect example of a difficult patient. You could call it a loose shoulder. You could call it some degree of multidirectional because there's an inferior component to it. Uh, but nevertheless, their anterior dislocation with hallmarks of a hill sacs. What's your recommendation on how to manage the anterior capsule when you are dealing with a sort of a bony defect and you're gonna do your ladder J? What is your criteria for uh, repairing? You made a comment, you don't always repair. So what is your criteria for dealing with capsule? In patients that have um, a genetic pathologicity and they suffer of concomitant traumatic anterior inferior instability is the only case where uh, I detach uh, the capsula from the medial glenoid and I to recreate a shift from uh, south to north. But another step that I think is very important in this kind of patients, the split of the sous cap. Instead of doing the, the, the split between two thirds inferior and one third superior, I do the split uh, a little more superior. So I have a more sous cap inferiorly that can help the common tendon in the muscular function on the, the guarantee stability in upper position. 
Inho, can I, Inho, sorry, Sergio, Inho was asking to say something. Okay, good. Yes, go Hi, ahead. Giovanni. Uh, thank Hi. you. Uh, your lecture is always clear. And I take it that you are a comment at the last slide, but I was always wondering how you deal with this failed Latazet procedure. What is your recommendation if you have a failure of the Latazet? Okay, you have to understand which is, of course, the cause of uh, failure. Uh, of course, uh, in uh, my patients that are, have a failure and they have a rate of failure that is between two, three uh, percent, uh, sometimes maybe that I miss a nil sucks that was very medial. And so in patients that don't play a uh, hover sport or contact sport, I did uh, a new scope with a remplissage bunker repair. In other patients, I use a graft of the crest, uh, of the iliac crest, and uh, I perform uh, a new uh, graft on the glenoid. Yeah, the Edeni Binetti. Exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, Giovanni, just a, a question to you. Uh, I think that revision of affiliate, uh, affiliate Latarget is a nightmare. It's very difficult. I faced that uh, two or three times in my life, and okay. I didn't add any Binetti, but I was mesmerized by the amount of fibrotic tissue, and the anatomy is absolutely, as Filippi Valenti says, distorted and the musculocutaneous nerve was in front of the screws and i had a lot of difficulty in taking out the screws of the failed latarge okay and i gave it up and i gave it up because the musculocutaneous nerve was in front of them and the elbow was uh, flexing all of the time so in my opinion sometimes you have to uh, leave the screws there and just think about the adenibinetti and the amount of fibrotic tissue is mesmerizing so uh do you think like me sometimes don't don't matter about the old screws even uh because you have the neurovascular bundle very close to that and just focus on the adenibinetti i had a lot of difficulty on that your thoughts uh, about this this is a difficult scenario sir i agree completely 100 percent is very very difficult and i learned from our friends jill Valsh that uh, revision uh, latarge is very difficult and i agree i did uh, many and uh, I, I realized that there is a lot of scar tissue and i'm surprised because sometimes uh, when they ask me how the latarge works i think that works because a lot of scar tissue that for some reason another position guarantee because sometimes uh, with hiji i have nice thoughts he tells me and we share opinion is the common tendon is subsca. Yes, five minutes after the surgery, but after one year, I have difficult to make a cleavage between the subsca and the common sure. tendon, as you say. So uh, I don't know exactly if you ask me why the Latarge works. Of course, because we improve the bone platform, but of course, there is a lot of scar tissue that, of course, help. Okay. Thank yeah. you. We need to move to the next lecture. Sorry. Uh, okay. we, we are on time. Okay, lovely. So the next speaker is our good friend from the United States, uh, Jeffrey. So Jeffrey Abrams, he's gonna talk about augmented banker repair. Jeffrey, the microphone is yours, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. And thank you, Danielle, for putting together such a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, today, I'd like to go a little further, and this would uh, be a good speech talk to follow Giovanni's. Uh, the bank cart repair is a very, very popular uh, in North America, actually all over the world. And uh, the question really can be, can this be modernized to deal with some of the critics and criticisms because of a bank cart repair may not be effective in many patients or some patients. I do have disclosures of companies that I have been assisting with. We know that the glenohumeral dislocation is a common event. Uh, the anterior dislocation, we'll speak primarily of a traumatic uh, uh, Tubbs lesion that, uh, uh, that we uh, know that they are a re result of trauma, not necessarily because of looseness. And we have many good options, both arthroscopic and open. We can deal with this with generally soft tissue repairs, uh, which are very popular because they anatomically repair the lesions, whether we do it arthroscopically or open. And you've just heard on some of the more difficult cases or higher risk patients, 
the core coid transfer, uh, the latter J, uh, would be an appropriate choice. I do think that the arthroscopic bank card repair is still very applicable, uh, particularly in people with small histories, initial dislocators, where there's not as much bony deficiency, but it also has been shown by Sugaya to be very effective with bony fractures of the glenoid rim. And I still think that a primary arthroscopic bank art repair has a high degree of success in both of these patients. We can see the problem well. We have very good view of the anterior inferior quadrant. We can repair the capsule and the labrum in an anatomic fashion, and we can work from sup inferior to superiorly to create a, an effective shift and thickening of the tissue to help protect against a recurrence. But we've learned over the years that recurrence may occur, and this may be the most common complication of a soft tissue repair. This graft is uh, one of uh, uh, um, Christian Gerber's, where he looked at the effectiveness of the latter J over more than the two years, but extending to five years. And the success of a soft tissue repair may fall short in individuals who continue to compete as time goes along. So maybe our two year requirement for the literature is uh, insufficient to real accurately report. So I think when we look at soft tissue to repair an instability event, we know that first time dislocators usually do not have significant bone issues. They can though with glenoid rim fractures, but the appeal of a soft tissue repair is that we are creating an anatomic repair. You've also heard of failures of latter J's. This is the same with failures of bank cards. Age, the younger, higher activities, collision sports, glenoid bone loss, off-track lesions clearly will present as an early recurrence after a bank card procedure. But I think when you look at five and 10 year results, you start wondering whether there's a capsular remodeling with combined trauma that can place certain shoulders at risk. So I'd like to present some ideas how to make your arthroscopic bank heart. We've learned about remplissage. You heard it briefly about the incorporation, posterior capsule infraspinatus into the hill Sachs defect. And we're starting to learn of the bipolar and the relationship of a larger humeral head lesion with a glenoid rim deficiency. So over the past 10 years, I've chosen about 25 patients with what I call moderate bone loss. This is between about 15 and 20% of the glenoid. Included in this were several seizure patients, revision or failed prior surgeries. The patients at risk, I feel, have multiple dislocation events. In this case, many times more than five. There's sporting activity in my world, wrestling, collision sports. They may even experience an instability event while sleeping or have history of seizures. And many of them have had a failed previous surgery. The apprehension sign is very important. Mm -hmm. The load and shift can often reproduce crepitus in the office when you examine the shoulder. Imaging studies can demonstrate bony changes of tissue MRIs, although not often my practice can show soft tissue injuries like haggle or lateral capsular injuries. When we look at the CT scan, we can try to estimate the amount of glenoid bone loss, as well as with some difficulty for me, understanding humeral bone loss and where is that hill sacs lesion how far is it from the rotator cuff insertion when we look at a load and shift toe we can appreciate the palpable effect with the arm in neutral a little bit of abduction we can see about posterior and inferior and we could also place the arm in a more provocative position and mm -hmm. see if it locks out 
but don't try 90 degrees, 90 degrees, because subscapularis can limit that anterior translation in this position. I still prefer lateral decubitus. However, beach chair position can be utilized. Additional portals are important to access the inferior glenoid in a more perpendicular approach. I still uh, appreciate a bank heart procedure when there is extensive labral pathology. This collision athlete has posterior labrum, anterior labrum, superior labrum. Often the complications of this surgery is that uh, they become a little bit stiff. So I find that if you could do an arthroscopic soft tissue repair that extends around the glenoid, this is extremely effective and does not often require bone augmentation. It's my left shoulder, I'm lateral decubitus, I'm mobilizing the tissue. I may even see the axillary nerve if I go inferior enough. I prepare the glenoid. If there's a little bone in that tissue, I bring that up as well. I can put my anchors on my anterior articular cartilage or anterior inferior. I also utilize the posterior portal to grab the inferior pouch. You heard earlier about patients who have laxity. It's important to deal and reduce the pouch inferiorly because this becomes anterior with the arm in provocative positions. Multiple passes can be performed to allow for a mattress suture configuration. In the inferior quadrant, I do believe that mattress sutures are more helpful in keeping the knots away from the humeral head, especially with these stronger suture material. In addition, I'd like to repair the slap tear, which all of us know can make the shoulder a little stiff. But in this case, that's the protection from the recurrence. So these large labral damaged shoulders, I think, do better with an arthroscopic bank heart repair combined with the superior labrum repair. Of the biceps anchor and restoration of the superior labrum. Try to resist pushing the biceps down, and then you can extend your repair to that anterior labral structures that have been detached. You can combine that with glenoid repair with the base of the superior labrum biceps complex. And to me, this is an anatomic type of repair that we're trying to combine with our patient. And I do not think that we need to consider uh, with the posterior, inferior, anterior, and superior repairs, I don't think we have to consider the additional bone even in a complex collision athlete. But here we have moderate bone loss. Looks benign from posteriorly, but from the anterior portal looking inferiorly, you can see how the humeral head likes to sit on the defect. And here I'd like to suggest that we consider either autograft or allograft. In this case, I'm presenting the clavicle autograft. Here is a patient, a left shoulder, lateral decubitus, and you can see the soft tissue anteriorly. In fact, you can see the sutures from the prior repair. And this is what I've included in the study. Harvested a portion of the clavicle, maybe eight millimeters, and with an anchor already in place, I am going to shuttle a suture through my graft and secure it to the anterior glenoid rim. I will now start bringing my soft tissue over the top because I believe the capsule provides proprioception and an additional degree of stability to the graft. The graft can rotate this way. It cannot. If I have anchors below, on top and in superior to my graft. So here are my sutures now securing just at the upper edge of the graft. And so this creates an inflammatory response. It widens the glenoid, it centers the humeral head and allograft, autograft, clavicle, potentially the uh, iliac crest. These 25 cases now have up to nine year follow-up in my study. CT scans were done on nine. 
uh, did not usually do a repeat CT scan on success. One of my patients did recur, required a ladder J. One had graft displacement early because the fixation in the suture material I did not feel uh, was adequate. However, the infection rate was zero in the arthroscopic procedure. My nerve injuries were zero, and this is very concerning to me with ladder J's and certain transfers. But as you can see, stiffness is still part of the issue, which in some cases people can look as protective and others can say, I would not wish to do this in an overhead throwing athlete. This is the eat inhibinet procedure that I'm talking and speaking about. It can be done arthroscopically. And my concern has been always the subscapularis issues, and particularly with patients who have recurrent surgery. I'd like to leave the subscapularis alone, treat the glenoid with widening with bone graft, and consider the capsular repair a part of the stabilization procedure. Again, these individuals return to their sports. In this case, they have some loss of external rotation. Maybe if I move them a little bit more quickly after surgery, I'd be better, but I am protected and I feel like I can understand what their recurrence risks are after a arthroscopic augmented bank card repair. Do we really need the sling? Well, a number of authors have now spoke about adding glenoid bone graft and avoiding the subscapularis and the conjoined tendon and the potential complications. And in these particular papers, including the NEAR Award 2019, I do feel that they have found that adding bone to glenoid and doing a soft tissue repair without the conjoined tendon going through the subscapularis split can be worthy of stabilization without some of the serious complications that can occur with this. So I'd like to conclude, not only for me, but for many others, the bank card is an anatomic operation, can restore a capsule, can repair the labrum, and can be successful whether you choose arthroscopic or open procedures. The risk of bone loss, however, is for real. It is easier for us to measure the glenoid bone loss. The hill Sachs lesion is being discussed, but I still don't think we have a very good way of preoperatively measuring that defect. And so it may be an intraoperative decision. Grafting the glenoid would seem to take some of the high risk patients and place them in a better category for short term and long term stability. In this case, in this study I'm presenting, I utilize the distal clavicle. I do feel that there are other choices. Iliac crest, in some countries, we're allowed to use allograft. We can, die, we can measure our defect, we can measure our bone graft, and we can adequately stabilize it. My comment to you all is beware of the subscapularis. I do not think even though that extra scar tissue that we spoke about earlier today is necessarily what we want with our patients and some of our patients have subscapularis complica complications that are serious and may affect the use of their shoulder, not only for their sporting events, but for continued surgery that may re be required even decades later. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Jeff, for your clear message. What a, what a great lecture again. Uh, we understand that nowadays the bone procedures are, uh, are the standard procedure for most of the patients with, with luxation. However, there is a clear space, a clear spot for the arthroscopic labrum uh, reconstruction, especially in the prime dislocators. Uh, can you tell us your experience on that? Yeah, I, I really think, you know, I would, I'm born at the right age. I watched extra articular procedures become intra-articular procedures, and I've felt that it is better for the anatomy of the shoulder. 
So my bias is to try to maintain articular anatomy. In this case, a first time dislocator, most often with the sports that I see, are primarily bank heart soft tissue lesions or small bony bank hearts. I would not delay their treatment till end of season with bony bank hearts. If you can address them early and place the bone back where it came from and put it anatomically repaired, I think you will have a high degree of success. Where I think our problem is, is the recurrent dislocators. An American once said, you don't have to fix first time dislocators. However, repair them prior to their second dislocation. <laughs> so my point would be, I think that the recurrence and probably the further glenoid changes, the humeral head bone loss, which we still are just trying to grasp the importance and the recurrent soft tissue injuries that Johnny so well, he did, so well described is an adaptation to instability and something needs to be done to address the recurrent dislocator, possibly different than the initial dislocator. So your opportunity to help this athlete is after the first most anatomic lesion and most anatomic repair. Thank you very much, Chef. We need to go ahead. Uh, I will ask you please to unshare your screen. And uh, now we invite Dr. Ashish Babulkar from Pune, India, who will illustrate us about the arthroscopic lateral jet procedure. Thank you, Daniel, Fosfandre, and Gaston Menio. It's such a pleasure, Sergio, to be back with you, the same team from ICSCS. And these are such fascinating lectures. Uh, the topics you've selected are eclectic. So I just cannot leave my screen. I'm totally focused on this. So continuing with this theme, uh, let me uh, pursue with the topic on Arthur Latarje and our experience. And we are aware that uh, the Latage has undergone so much evolution from the original accidental Latage that it was from the failed L3 Tria that Michel Latage did to the extent where Laurent Lafort converted. And I think that was a complete inflection point to introduce arthroscopic Latage. And you must understand where I came from that I was a dedicated open Latage surgeon and I was a complete naysayer against Arthur Latage till such time that I visited Annecy and it took one day in Lauren Lofos's theater where he did five arthrolatages to convert me completely. So having come from there, we all agree that uh, after that excellent talk by Giovanni to explain that there is a lot of difference between latages that are done between all of us, depending on how we split the subscap, how we deal with the capsule, do we release it, do we repair it, do we burn it? And also where we put the graph, whether it's a standing graph or a Bristow type graph. So I don't think all the latages between all of us are the same. So because of the variations that we do between ourselves. So on the arthro latage, I do accept that there's a steep, steep learning curve. And I still have some very close international friends who have sworn they would never ever do an arthroscopic latage. And that kind of freaked me out in my initial days that oh, this is something that should never be done. There are risks. It is not really an arthroscopic procedure where because it is mostly a soft tissue endoscopy. And that's why we must understand that the field can be full of blood and you can get stuck and you should be able to bail out quickly. You are flirting very close to the nerves, especially the musculocutaneous and axillary nerve. There have been contentions uh, issues about the arthroscopic lethargy, about the fact that one doesn't deal with the capsule, then the graft is not extra articular, and one doesn't address the IGHL or in fact burn down the capsule. But it still remains a very elegant and a most precise technique to fix in the graft in the most accurate manner uh, ever compared to all the other techniques as such. So um, the reason I'm so fascinated, I think. It's a procedure that 
um, requires a relentless pursuit of perfection and you have to approach with great tenacity because it requires patience. My first arthroscopic lethargy is in 2013 used to take almost three and a half, four hours. And we've come down over the last so many years that now an average time this year has been about between um, one hour, 15 minutes to one hour, 30 minutes. Uh, so it's a matter of practice. It's a matter of understanding. And once you reconcile that this is a procedure that requires uh, a little gumption and you're ready to give it, then you will achieve this. The, uh, sometimes you're faced with an epileptic patient, such as this 25-year-old uh, gentleman who's a uh, chronic seizures patient with an excess of 30% bone loss. I'm not going to use the coracoid because of two different reasons. The graft can get avulsed, so we prefer the ICBG in these patients. And the fact that I have a much larger graft that I can bespoke design for fitting in a 30% defect. I use the same technique as the arthrolatagia, but I fix the screws to the eyelet crest, as you see on the top there first, and then resect the eyelet crest to get a tricortical graft of about 25 mm uh, width. It is important to find the axillary nerve, dissect it under vision, and at the same time, give the same respect to the musculocutaneous nerve in every arthrolatagia case as possible. And then this is, uh, the final, you can see how well the graft is so flush as if it is designed. And I remember Joe DiPier's words that God designed the coracoid to fit for the lethargy. So as if it was <laughs> tailor-made for the lethargy. And you suddenly, when you start fixing the graft in a congruent dark manner, you will agree that it absolutely fits the curvature as if it was designed. And I'm very much here on the same page uh, as Jeff Fabrams, uh, that the capsule and the labrum are proprioceptive organs and you need to repair them. So three years down our experience, I started to save the capsule and the labrum. And now as far as possible, I would do a capsular labrum closure after the latage. It adds another 10 minutes to the procedure, but I think it makes a lot of sense. So if the capsule is viable and labrum is viable, I actually resect the labrum on the top end, keep it connected to the six o'clock position and park it in the posterior portal with a suture inside it. So a PDS suture that goes inside it will keep it parked. At the end of my latage, as you see that the graft is down here, I will go and pick up the labrum, hold it vertically stretched, and pin it back with a couple of anchors, and then give them. So number one, it renders the graft extra-articular, so saves the humeral cartilage, provides a proprioceptive organ there, and uh, makes it as anatomical as can be. So, of course, in cases where there is no labrum and it's a poor quality tissue, I'd go ahead and just debride it and the latage would still work. I would always, always do a post-op CT scan for all my patients between about three to six months post-operatively because the x-rays do not give us enough information. So, yeah. it's important to understand that graft has actually healed. It is not mandatory that it will heal. And the position of the screws and the alignment of the graft uh, whether it is flush or recessed. So, as Giovanni referred, the osteolysis and latage are inseparably associated with each other. And especially for surgeons who do latages for all their instabilities where there is minimal Grignard bone loss, feel free to expect extensive osteolysis. This is Philip Morado's paper, and there's another paper by Young Algree in the cases of TA you can see that there's extensive graft osteolysis. It can have clinical unsatisfactory results and up to 22% failure rates. And of course, that naked metalwork that is there can damage the cartilage of the humeral head as well. So the only two indications that I would use a latage for in the absence of glenoid bone loss would be one case like this where there's a complete haggle and there's a, no capsule there for repair this is a patient who was dislocated 20, 25 times and came in very late. And there's nothing there to repair. I would do the latage. And perhaps the patient who's a failed bank art with very poor quality capsular labral tissue, I might consider doing a latage. But that really is a complete exception. A good paper from the French Arthroscopic Society. Massive number of patients, 1555. Very minimal uh, complication rate with the art latage. But a word of caution here. These surgeons are volume surgeons who have done extensive arthroscopic latage 
with amazing experience. So I don't think we should compare them with all the other uh, conventional surgeons as such. In our study, which has just been submitted recently, where we studied all our graphs and uh, we have 200 patients in the study, uh, we found out that 85% of our graphs are in the lower sector and about 12% in the middle sector. Only a couple of them would come, came in, in the earlier stages in the high sector. We also studied our alpha angles of the screw insertion and we're pleased to say that 93% of our graphs were flush, about 4% were proud and 3% were recessed. Um, we're considering that the average lateralization was just 3.3 mm with our arthritis. Of course, our later patients in the recent uh, experience have been far better. We also con compared our first 25 to our second 25 and found out there was an incredible improvement between the parallel screws, the lack of skew screws, and only one patient had screws that were out in our second half of our study. So we think that at least 50 arthrolatages is your learning curve after which we start flattening the curve as such. Why would one do a CT scan post-op? For several reasons. Number one, six to 10% of the revisions are due to screw problems, and they can be several on there. Um, if the graft is a fibrous union or a non-union, the screws are inevitably going to break and the x-rays do not give you the full picture. Erroneous placements have problems. Uh, most common reason for me to remove the screws is suprascapular neuropathy that gets unrecognized. If I have screws in the upper sector going upwards towards the superior spinal glenoid notch, I would definitely remove those screws within three to six months, uh, provided the graft has healed completely. And of course, to note down osteolysis, which the x-rays do not show you adequately. I think Giovanni has a huge lifetime work on osteolysis and lethargy here. Now, these are some of our problem patients. And this is a 53-year-old doctor, chronic depression on meds for depression. He's 120 kg weight, fell in the bathroom on the ninth day post-op. And then we said, it's okay, we don't need to do. We did his x-rays and looked excellent. Uh, started his rehab after two months and was doing well. But as I said, the x-rays don't show you enough. Houston, we have a problem. So yeah. although the first two CT scans show okay, on the second one, you see the graph has completely avulsed off. He's clinically doing well, but this, unless we did a CT scan, would never ever notice what is happening here. This is a young 21-year-old wrestler whose graph never healed and he continued wrestling. Uh, and then seven months down the line, his crew started to break in. We had to do an Eden hibernate for him to revise him as such. So you can see that the CT scan shows you a far better picture and the reality than the X-ray can reveal half the truth. And then occasionally you do, I do a premature coracoid uh, cut and then I have a very small 18 mm coracoid. I would use only one single screw will go slow on these patient. He was a revision latage from a failed bank card, but fortunately his bone graft has healed and that was well established only on the CT scan and not on the X-ray. So in conclusion, I think coming to our end, uh, there are several other issues about the assessment of glenoid bone loss. If we have imperfect in information, I don't think we can take perfect judgment. Uh, restriction of external nutrition was noticed in our series when the graphs were higher position. And then there's a complication rate with uh, nerve injuries. I think Inho John's paper here from 1999 and several others I've shown that you need to be careful about the nerves. On the revision lethargy, I'm not so worried post arthroscopy, we see a much lesser scarring. Mm -hmm. And if my patient has fallen, injured, and broken the graft, I'm okay with that. My biggest worry is the grafts that have healed and then they have failed. And those are the laxity ones, and those are the nightmare ones. So lastly, in conclusion, I think the long-term failure of lethargy can be a very challenging problem. I don't think lethargy is a solution for all difficult instabilities. Sure. Unless there's bone loss, we should not attempt the lethargy. And there's a lot of discussion between whether the ICBG is better or the lethargy is better or the tibial allograft is better, but that's for another day's discussion. But osteolysis, as I said, is inseparable from lethargy if you do it in the absence of glenoid bone loss. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Ashish. I am sure that Sergio has a question. 
10 million, but I'm going to do only one. I would like to talk <laughs> five hours about this. Uh, I'm going to do a question, uh, and I would like to listen, Jeffrey, Giovanni, and Ashish, because I think it's a very practical question for, all of the, for everybody who is seeing us uh, all around the world. All of us have, uh, all of you have mentioned it about doing a capsular application intraoperatively. But the thing is that in my experience, when you have a, a chronic dislocator and you are doing a lethargy, in spite of wanting or not wanting to do uh, a capsular repair, the, the fact is that in, the, in, uh, in practice, there is, there, is no, there is no soft tissue to be repaired at all because soft tissues, they are very damaged in chronic uh, dislocators. So having said that, I, I dare to say that that would be much more in chronic dislocators a theoretical issue than a practical possibility. And I have a lot of experience with people that dislocated 30 times, 40 times, and soft tissues, they basically, they are not there anymore. So having said that, do you agree with me in this long time chronic dislocators? I, I think that this is important from a very practical point of view. Can yeah, I go in first? Wants to say. Yeah, yeah. Obrigado, Sergio. Um, your, your point is well taken, but I mean, you know my country, and in India, we get 50 time dislocation and 60 time dislocation. Sure. Our healthcare system is built like that. So there are challenges inbuilt into the system. And I don't think that's true. Even when I used to do the open lethargies and I did a fair bit because I trained under Joe DeBeer, uh, I think the capsule is always there. And mm -hmm. I can foresee a scenario where you've got rugby players, you've done a lethargy and they're stable in the mid range, but they are unstable in the abduction, explanation, throwing position. So you can have that situation where a patient is not dislocating, but still unstable. Mm -hmm. It is that IGHL repair, which will give him stability in that abduction, external rotation position. So if you have a capsule labrum, please, I beckon you, please go ahead and put in at least one anchor or tie it down to your screw. I would do that. There is that rare situation in an arthralataje where the capsule labrum is completely torn off and then yes. that's fine. Oh. The lataje will still work. But if ever you have a capsule and if you don't have a labrum, make that effort to get that IJHL because you want a north to a south to north pants or west repair. Yeah, it doesn't shift. matter what shift. you're doing to the subscap. Is that you cannot measure the capsule stretch and the volume loss that has happened. You have to factor that in into a repair to make that a real successful procedure. Okay, Jeffrey, your issues on this soft tissue, uh, poor tissue quality. I have seen this so much, so many times. Uh, and when you see that, well, do you agree with me that many times you have nothing to do just, uh, uh, I would say, uh, upon the Lacarge itself? So the, the case that you've stated and I have seen is when thermal treatment was common. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you, those individuals did, did have an absence of capsule. Mm -hmm. But I tend to agree with Ashish that many times we do have some capsule and it's usually inferior. And the yeah. question really is, can the inferior capsule be brought up? In some cases, complication of capsule repair and bone grafting combined makes a shoulder tight. So I don't think in that case, the inferior pouch can be reduced, but bring your capsule directly over your bone graft and don't try to do too much of a shift. Yeah. But I do think you can close capsule in many cases. Mm -hmm. The ones that you have to be suspicious is the Hagel lesion that mm -hmm. has missed and many years has been present. Again, it is a difficult capsular problem. But I do agree, even with multiple dislocations, maybe arthroscopic is easier than easier. open. You could actually see the capsule inferiorly almost in all cases. So there's something to repair, and I, and I agree with the speakers. I would try to repair it when possible. Okay, Giovanni, any issues on this? No, no, yeah, we, are, we are not yeah, yeah. To. Okay, I don't stress in a standard uh, latarche if uh, even if they recurred uh, maybe 20, 25 times the capsular repair. 
Uh, otherwise, they have a, a laxity component. Mm -hmm. I have more or less a 1,500 Latarge, and in 95% of these, I uh, did not fix the capsula, and uh, I don't have uh, results that are different from the standard literature. Ashish, I have a question for you, to, and Johnny, yes, you sir. can chime in. When you looked at the x-ray carefully that you showed of your seizure patient and maybe two slides before, you look at the glenoid view, and it appears that the humeral head on these x-rays basically is sitting on top of your repair. Is this ideal situation where the shoulder, the humerus stays somewhat anterior, inferior translated? Or are you trying to see a more classic picture of the humeral head centered on the glenoid? I know arthroscopically it looks pretty good, but when you get your post-op x-rays, Sometimes the humeral head sits, what I think, on top of your transferred coracoid. What do you consider ideal in when looking at your post-op x-rays? And do you make any adjustments because of this? In one case, this may be why I fix capsule. So what do you feel about that type of x-ray view when you're, when you're done with your surgery? Jeffrey? That's why this, I think Karen called you the smartest person here. Uh, <laughs> it's an astute point. It's a very, very important point. And it's very critical to get that head of humerus in the center of that damn glenoid. And uh, I find three reasons for that. One, if you've not restored the glenoid bone loss adequately, number one. Number two, the capsular repair will help push that head back in there. And number three, in quite of you doing everything, you've done the bone block and then you've done a capsule repair, irrespective of ICBG. I find that a problem of either the scapular positioning or the imbalance between the external and internal rotator. And I see that very commonly in the epileptics. And so we have a fantastic rehab team who helps to restore that and we do serial x-rays because clinically it's very difficult to fathom what is happening there. But if you were to check the in external rotation strength, and if you find that 20, 30% weaker than the internal rotation strength, and they have this posture where the shoulders up in front, be careful, that lethargy will fail. Mm -hmm. And you need to have a fantastic rehab team to complement a good surgical result like what Giovanni and yourself do. We have uh, time for two short questions and two short answers. So we move to the next speakers. Uh, Cesar, you were raising your hand and then Inho. Go ahead. Sí, muchas gracias. Una, una pregunta yes, no. thank you. A question that always comes up is among those patients that do not have bony defects, without bony defects, but they're young, sports people, they're there at the verge, those we doubt of. This is a question for any of the three with your excellent presentations. But in those patients, the question, specific question is, we don't want to place any bone, but if we know if that we go to arthroscopy, we are almost going to fail. Uh, patients we have already operated on, they have collision sports, they're young, they have almost all the traits of those patients, but they have intact bone. They're, they have some laxity, they've had some dislocation, some have had some surgeries and they dislocate again. Do you think we can do a later jet, but without that bony biscuit, in other words, doing uh, that type of effect with a capsule plication or a bank card, a conventional open bank card. So we go directly from uh, arthroscopy to a bristol ladder j so that's the question do you think that there are intermediate points using both techniques in hope, uh, right. in hope yeah. you can i have that. a very uh, short practical question to jeffrey no, no, and uh, no i mean i was meaning your, your the answer to that question and then go ahead with your question okay okay got it right so i'll take that cesar thank you okay. uh, this is interesting, and uh, I can tell you for one thing, I, I can get guillotined in France for saying this, but I would never do a Latarje in the absence of glenoid bone loss just because he was an athlete. 
but I know where this comes from. And there's a lot of push in Australia, South Africa and France to do a Latajip across the board. Uh, I must say this with confidence that we have enough athletes over it who won gold medals at the Commonwealth Games and also the Olympics. I would still do a nice capsule labrum repair uh, with our rehab team. I would still invest in a nice anatomical procedure. I don't think the graft works in the absence of glenoid bone loss. If you follow them properly within a year and two years, that entire graft undergoes osteolysis. And if that does, because based on the, uh, the, um, the physics and biomechanics there, I don't think those screws are going to remain wide open. I think Jill Walsh uh, flirted a little with bias screws and he published that article uh, in JSCS where he had extensive osteolysis with bias screws. It was not the bias screws. It was the fact that the bone grafts were done in the absence of glenoid bone loss. And you should still do an anatomic procedure. If that were to fail, I would still offer the Latage later as a second procedure. Okay, you do not know what you are missing not doing the open bank card. <laughs> Inho, what, what was okay. your question? Okay, I, I, I mean, um, many people in the audience would uh, ask you questions, Jeffrey and Ashishi. In your practice, how often you do a remplissage procedure and how often you do rotate interval closer for standard arthroscopic bank heart? For the uh, remplissage, I would say I do this about 25% of the time. I look for a heel sacs lesion that is more lateral. So the concerning lesion that Johnny had presented the medial lesion is a problem. That's an articular fracture. And I don't think you can put soft tissue into an articular fracture and expect a good result. So if it's a deep hill sacs lesion laterally, I often put my anchor in, my sutures in, but I do not tie them until the end of the surgery because when I pull on those sutures, it's like a Fukuda retractor. It pulls the humeral head posteriorly and gives me an extra instrument in the shoulder. The rotator interval, I often, I do close, I would say more than 25% of the time. And I attempt to incorporate the coracohumeral ligament, which is lateral or outside of the subscapularis, not just the middle capsule ligament. And that with a suture that will become non-abrasive to the head, I think runs the risk of tightening the shoulder. So not so good in an overhead thrower. So I would say at least one third of the time, I am adding one or both of those techniques to my bank card. Okay. Thank you. We will go ahead yeah. with the next uh, presentation. We are running 10 minutes late uh, in Ho. Uh, from Korea, we appreciate very much your participation and let's go ahead with your talk. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, it's a truly honor to join this uh, meeting because mm -hmm. this is uh, has a lot of memory with the ICSES 2019. Now we move on to the uh, rotate cuff and uh, 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 Osvandre and Daniel, your passion in 2019, it reminds me a lot about the history in 2016 where the ICSCS schedule was held. And still I remember that the stimulating, uh, you know, uh, moment which I shared with you all. Okay, uh, for the last 10 years, more and more SCR surgery were done here in my clinical practice. So we have done over 132 cases of SCR and let's share what we learned for the last 10 years. Most of you are well aware of this graft preparation. We do uh, use a double folded fascia lata autograft and this is the uh, MRI pre-op course of three months, nine months, 
and then eventually patients have a good uh, functional outcome. So here I would raise three important questions with you. First one is, does the SCR really improve shoulder function? Second, do we need to change surgical technique anymore? Third, do you think SCR can delay rotate cuff arthroplasty, which is usually indicated for large massive tear? So the first question, SCR improve shoulder function. So this is our uh, midterm clinical outcome from 2013 to 2019. If you look at this graph, brief, pre-op, post-op, yes, the outcome improves. I mean, the uniformly in the literature, they say the favorable clinical outcome after SSCR. How about the midterm MRI follow-up? I mean, we uh, take the MRI at follow-up period and it was, uh, the, the graft healing was rather disappointing. Even though the clinical outcome was very good, the graft healing was rather disappointing, 67%. So when we analyze this graft failure pattern, mostly the graft failure occurred on the humeral head side. So why it happens on the humeral head side, not the glenoid side? We tell a timing mostly within three months and some until six months. So early failure was the uh, consequence of this uh, double-folded uh, fascia lata. So how we can reduce graft failure? So we had to consider graft choices. The fascia lata is good enough or what about the graft preparation, how to adjust the proper tension and how to adjust the secure fixation. Do we need to change the surgical technique? Yes. The first question was, double-folded fascia lata is strong enough to resist the humeral head migration? This five or six millimeter graft thickness is not strong enough to resist the humeral head migration because the active uh, shear force of humeral head migration upward is quite uh, strong. So what we planned was polypropylene mesh augmented graft. This polypropylene mesh is often used in general surgery hernia, hernia repair. So we added this mesh in between double folded fascia lata so that we can have a sandwich in between. So why we use this one? Because once you have this uh, mesh graft in between double folded fascia lata, as you can see here, stress string curve changes. It became much stronger. It provides initial stability. So here you can see this is only fascia lata. This is a uh, double folded. This is triple folded. So uh, it's good enough to have a one mesh with double folded fascia lata. So you may think a mesh is a really good enough for tissue ingrowth. According to the, our animal study, this is a mesh. And this is fibrous tissue in between these two uh, graft and you can see the tissue ingrowth to the mesh. So this is good enough for fibrous tissue layer. So now let's have a quick review on the surgical technique. So we do surgery on beach chair position, and this is a fascia lata. So we make an incision because we use only double folder. The incision is not big enough. This is how we prepare the uh, mesh and the fascia lata. And we uh, suture all along this uh, fascia lata. This is a mark so that we are not confused intra out flow. And then we put, we put uh, three anchors on the glenoid side, usually 12, 10, two o'clock position. So we switched from two anchors to three anchors because it provided better distribution of stress. So equal load of, uh, equal uh, distribution of load was the advantage if you use the three anchors. And then we do a preparation in the uh, humeral head. 
just a uh, soft tissue, not uh, deep enough to the cancellous bone because this cortical bone preservation is important for anchor screw uh, stability. And then we pull out these uh, sutures outside and then we have to deliver this graft. So we use uh, this uh, chip line uh, method. So uh, we make uh, one stitch in between three anchors and then we pull this uh, uh, sutures so that we can deliver the graft to the glenoid. So after we deliver the graft, we make a suture on the glenoid side, and then uh, two more anchors on the uh, greater tuberosity. Then pass the sutures through this graft and secure fixation. Then it's almost done. So uh, this is important step from now on, which I made a modification. After you uh, fix this graft, the tuberosity, now we need to find where the remaining bursa is. This bursa tissue, remaining bursa tissue, you should be very careful because if you pull very hard, bursa usually uh, uh, torn. So you need to pull this bursa and then pass these uh, stitches so that we can have a bursa on top. According to our previous study, this uh, bursa tish, tissue has a lot of uh, blood supply and uh, tissue healing potential. So after, uh, if I summarize, three anchors on the glenoid side, secure fixation of the graft, and then pull this uh, bursa tissue on top so that uh, we can call it a bursa over the top. So uh, we made a modification at 2016 and before 2016, only fascia lata. After 16, we made a modification with the mesh. And the demographic, we had an analysis, pre of demographic, more or less the same, but pre of radiographic data, more or less the same, but clinical outcome equally improved. But here's what I would like to emphasize to you all. Radiologic outcome was a rather different because since we use this mesh graft, we had a higher graft healing rate compared to the fascia lata only, no graft failure at glenoid site, and no early graft failure within six months. So this mesh gave uh, early initial strengths. Thicker graft, once it is healed, yes, we could maintain a wider acromial humeral distance. So this is a pre-op MRI, and this is a post-op six months MRI. Now you can see this uh, double layer fascia lata with uh, mesh inside. So what about the uh, SCR uh, longevity? Can we trust the SCR to uh, prevent rotate cup arthropathy? Yes, we did analysis, uh, analysis until two years. Rotate cup arthropathy progression was rather minimal if we have good integrity. So once you have a healing of the graft, uh, arthropathy progression was very little. However, once we have a failure, if there is no integrity, then cup tear arthropathy progress. So here's a, a clue. Failed graft, pre-op, acromial humeral distance, 18 months post-op, you see the humeral head migration upward. But if you have a good healing of graft, Pre of acromic humeral distance has been much wider in 20 months post op. So, SCL by using mesh graft, I think this we can have a thinner graft and better initial strength and enhance the biologic scar formation through this mesh and better graft incorporation at post op. So, uh, if I can summarize, Clinical outcome improved with SCR, 
with or without mesh. And craft healing was also improved if you use a mesh craft. And arthritic change can be delayed if we have a good integration of SCR. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much, Inho. Thank you. Sergio, your time for, or Ashish, Ashish, we have time for one quick question, please. Yep. Short question and short answer. Uh, <laughs> you, you need to unmute, Ashish. Hi, Inho. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And it's nice to know that outside Mihata's designer study that you have such a good result. I would like to know your experience with using SCR in the presence of uh, pseudo paralysis. Yes, that's a very good point. Actually, uh, we uh, described that the pseudo paralysis in our uh, paper published, but still it's a valuable option. The worst problem is if you have a sub-step deficiency and very advanced infraspinatus muscle wasting, it's not really good. The outcome is not as you expected, but at least the large massive tear with the reasonable SCR, uh, reasonable subscan, repairable, then you can expect good result. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Inho. We will move to the next presentation now. Jose Carlos Garcia from the NION Group in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, he will show us his technique, his robotic technique for latissimus dorsi transfer. Thank you, Jose Carlos, for joining us. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, all my colleagues from all over the world. Uh, just a minute. Can you see my screen, black screen? Yes. Just, just yes. one minute, sorry. Uh, uh, yes, now. We are from Sao Paulo, Brazil. These are my disclosures. I'd like to talk to robot, about robot latissimus dorsi transfer. It's a challenging trope because latissimus dorsi, dorsi transfer has many applications and i'll give you an overview of this technique i think you you like this is what we do we face when we, when we transfer latissimus dorsi huge approach uh, with scar tissue formation after and pain then our idea was do something smaller because the surgery is in evolution from open to endoscopic key and think the next time, next step is the robotic one. Advantages are endoscopic, minimal, minimally invasive, in stereoscopic, uh, 3D dimensions view, tremor filtration, and device with seven degrees of freedom that makes very uh, simple to manage. The, the, the device have like a worst, like a hand. It's like you are using your uh, stitches or something, some, some device that you use every day in open surgery. And of course, ergonomy, because I want to make surgeries until 80 years old. To do what you do best, better and better, then we developed this technique. The first time we did this is, is a long time ago, nine years before. And this was what you did this is the latissimus dorsi when you could see in the cadaver then uh, we start the clinical use why are i'm using this for for accessory nerve lesions for transfer for massive rotator cuff tears and transfer for subscapularis and some other uh, problems of scapula here was how accessory nerve is Rotunately uh, treated. These are the two possible surgeries. And we uh, were figuring out why don't use the latissimus dorsi as the instantaneous rotational center moves from medial to lateral during abduction, then it would be more uh, rational. It's like the upper trapezium. Medialization of latissimus dorsi could less moment of downward rotation. Transfer to latissimus dorsi in abduction changes its action from downward rotation and depression to upward rotation and depression, improving elevation mechanics. Uh, remembering that happens because levator scapula is weaker than the upper trapezium. Then we 
figure out to do the, how to do this by robot. And this is the case. This is a patient with uh, accessor an accessory nerve lesion and his, her scapula. You can see there's a very important winging and there are dysfunction of the scapula. And this is the way we do the surgery. This is how we, we position the patient. There's the decubitus. There are no natural cavities. Then you have to create a cavity to insert this uh, optics and the device. Here, how we make the surgery. Here is an external view of the surgery. And here is how it looks internally. The teres major is separated by the, uh, the lat latissimus dorsi in this image, as you can see. Here, cutting the latissimus dorsi very near its insertion, cutting more, and you can see the radial nerve just uh, below the latissimus dorsi. And uh, we start to uh, manage the latissimus dorsi to separate it from the teres major. I'm separating from the teres major. Here you can see better the latissimus. This is the quadrangular space. Uh, uh, don't go there, but just to show you how it looks like. Then uh, we try. We start to make some sutures inside the body. These sutures are important to pull out of the body this latissimus dorsi by the, the portal, the optics portal. We generally use this. Here I'm, think, I'm taking the wire, and for the surgery. I put the latissimus dorsi out, then uh, I pass this subcutaneously to a small open on the, the scapular spine. Uh, the levator scapula and the rhomboid minor are also subcutaneous passed through this small open in the spine, the scapular spine, and all sutured. Here are the, sut the final sutures. And again, to better understand. And this is the final result of the patient. You can see that 11 weeks postoperative, she is very well. And here is the retraction he gained after surgery. It's very impressive how good uh, it works with the latissimus dorsi. This other patient with a stroke, uh, we start showing the quadrangular space, latissimus dorsi, and in this patient, we did uh, just the, the latissimus dorsi transfer because he had a different kind of uh, scapular disease or scapular dyskinesia. Here, cutting the latissimus very near the bone. You could see the bone before. Yes. It's a very cautious, uh, the use of the scissors, suturing again putting out of the body and again, making the sutures out of the body now and passing to the scapula to treat some the scapular dyskinesia. This is the final surgery. It's okay. There are other applications used for massive rotator cuff tears. I'll just show you the last part. The first of the, the second the latissimus dorsi is the same, but you use these uh, uh, wires to pass subcutaneously to the ten, to the the rotator cuff to the deltoid approach. Sorry, and here is the final. And finally, the subscapularis. I think this is one of the good applications we have done now. But now we are done in uh, dorsal decubitus and instead of the the. Supin the cubitus. Here, subscap totally uh, devastated after a Bristol surgery that he has 30 years before. Here's the position we did the patient, the insertion of the robot in the axilla. Here, how the robot works in this space. And this is the video. Oh, sorry. This is the latissimus. I removed and inserted in the humerus. 
is the latissimus, radial nerve is the schizer. You can move the radial nerve, see the humerals shaft. Then we find out the margin of uh, the latissimus dorsi, the distal margin, and the, the uh, proximal margin, and then we we use to do, to 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 remove the latissimus and separate the him from the teres major again. The device are not uh, done for surgery of orthopedic surgery. Then we have some problems sometimes. It's not so easy, but here you can see we. Um, removing some adhesions of the rhomboid major and latissimus. Here, just a small approach to do, to do that, all that. We have to remove all the adherents, the adhesions, you have the latissimus, and we transfer to the subdeltoid space and insert him on the humor uh, on the uh, less tuberosity of the humerus, as we can see here. This is the latissimus coming up, and this is the result. I'd like to thank you for this explanation, and I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Really amazing. Uh, is there any question, Sergio? We have time for a question. Inho. Inho. Jose, it was amazing technique. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing technique. Any chance we can apply robotic surgery to rotate cuff or glenohumeral surgery? Yes, yes. What is I the think, future? Uh, I think uh, we have this this space for do that. Uh, we have to. Uh, developed some devices because the robot's not adapted to orthopedic surgery, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I think in the future, the robots will be the standards we will have to use in all uh, applications. Uh, I don't know how long this will happen, but uh, I think in the next 10 years, we will change a lot. Now we have some robots for uh, prosthesis in knee and uh, in hips and in the next years to come from shoulder, then I think the robotics are the future and are all the parts of our day-by-day uh, -day OR. Sure, sure. Thank you. Great presentation. We need to move to the next one, the last presentation, but not least. Cesar, thank you for joining us. It's been my pleasure to be here and share with you and to be part of all this. I feel like Messi, who moved from uh, Barcelona to London, and I will speak about proximal bicep uh, ruptures or tears. This is a topic that is a passion for me, and I think that the biceps has become very important lately, which it wasn't considered before. And I compare it to the impingement because we would operate on the impingement many years ago. But I think that now some of the pain in the anterior shoulder that we do not understand where they come from, the biceps has explained them, especially the long portion of the biceps. Biceps is a muscle, especially in its long uh, portion genetically for flexing and in the case of the shoulder it goes from upwards to downwards from the back to the front and that change in direction causes the biceps to form a major torsion that causes a big stress and that's where the arcoid fibers are there and the other is that the traction uh, creates forces above the glenna uh, according to failure, 65 percent of the patients with they have pain in the anterior aspect of the bow of the shoulder have problems in the biceps, and that explains how some things can happen. And the alarm, the red flags that it is affected, the biceps, is 
the pain, the change in the disposition of the collagen fibers, the tears in the uh, process or micro instability and the changes in the architecture of the pulley and lesions that are associated, things that are, for instance, difficult to see in the studies, uh, for instance, the uh, fall, uh, those that uh, the overhead throwers suffer these, and this abduction in external rotation causes the stress to go especially to the upper part and the first trajectory of the five centimeters of the biceps. That's where normally the biceps suffers. According to the anatomy, the biceps is a point, it shares certain structures that surround it. And because of its characteristics, it's a point that has many collagen nociceptors and of the arcuate, and that makes it very sensitive point. It's not the same to get a blow close to the eye than in the eye. All the lesions that are close to the area of the biceps but don't affect it, don't have a problem. For instance, a tears of the rotator cuff, practically patients come anatomically normal and they don't affect, they don't have a pain. But when they start to affect the biceps, we find this conflict zone. The traction of uh, the subscapular goes forwards and the, the others go in different direction. This generates conflicts and this coincides with the outward site. And basically we have intraarticular lesions, we have the slab, the pulley, and associated to the breakage of the supraspinatus, and extraarticular, the bicipital uh, area, slab, of course, the upper labrum uh, lesion, uh, we know it, so I will not uh, speak about it in, when it's grade one. We just do the treatment and we do not operate on it. And then, yes, we try to do it. If it's a young patient, low demand, we try to repair them. And if it's an older patient, we directly go with tenoblasty. That's what we do in our service. This is the configuration we used before. Practically, it's no longer used and we prefer this type of configuration. At the beginning, we would do this, that uh, it just uh, push the biceps from the top and we try to leave the edge of the biceps free so that the elasticity and the traction of the biceps would not interfere that much. We are not saying that it cannot be done. When you do it from the top, it generates more pain, but after three, four months, it starts to work as it should. But if we can, we prefer to leave free the uh, upper uh, rim of uh, the biceps. This is the post-op control. We have had cartilaginous slab. The gap was practically not seen in the MRI and we separated it. It was separated together with the cartilage or associated to Vanguard lesions. We always think it's better to repair, especially in patients up to 40 years of age. And the second group of lesions are those associated to the pulley. Basically, there are four types, those that only affect the pulley, those that affect the pulleys and the supraspinatus, those that affect the pulleys and the infraspinatus, and those that affect the pulley uh, in both directions. We, when there is, of course, a dislocation of the biceps, normally a large lesion of the biceps is associated to the subscapularis that pulls from it. So many times when we have a, a biceps uh, lesion, we should think of a lesion in the subscapularis and vice versa. This place of uh, the pulleys, and to me it is it equates the eye of the shoulder, so it's formed by the superior glenohumeral ligament and the progression of the subscapularis. In the MRI, it's difficult to see this place precisely, but there are indirect signs that uh, tell us that there is something affected. Cis, for instance, or edema, as you can see there. All this leads to suspect that there is a conflict area. Many times the biceps comes before the tear of the of the rotator cuff because it is and sometimes one is the consequence of the other sometimes it starts with a congestion sometimes in the biceps sometimes in the pulley sometimes in both 
mechanical, a physical failure, and sometimes it, it, it happens the other way around. So the tears precede the mechanical instabilization, but you should suspect and you should go look for it. I am not speaking uh, of saying that a biceps in this condition, you have to do a ten, an approach, uh, a tenodesis, and the idea is to do a tenotomy or a tenodesis. I think that tenotomy is much simpler in the practice, but I think that a tenodesis is the right thing because we have had patients referred to us and the only problem is a pop -A arm and we have even had to operate on them. We, I think that the pop -A arm is not as uh, innocent or as naive as we think. And I think that even if it's not painful, you have to bear it in mind. The place where to fix it it varies and we know that it goes all along the uh, fixation sites of the biceps and in all the washers we know that the, if there is a change of the cartilage towards that bone one centimeter in every direction so we can move even one centimeter inside the joint without affecting a deduction and abduction with respect respect to the type of implant, it's varied and it depends on the experience. We prefer anchors without sutures and the evolution of the treatment in our service was this. We would do it open, we would fix with one of the methods, then we move to a mini open and arthroscopy. Here we detached, you all know how this is done, and we would fix. Usually we would fix it uh, open with anchors or we could fix it with this type of biotenodesis screws. It depends on the characteristic and whatever we have available, that's where it's fixed. And what we have been doing lately is this type of surgery. And basically what we do is in lateral decubitus with the arm in abduction, which we think is the best anatomical position for the biceps to preserve its length. We fix the biceps here. The technique shows that you first cut and then you fix. We prefer this type. Of, we prefer this type of fixation. And here we cut first and then we fix. Since we do it in lateral decubitus and in extension, we think that it can offer the chance of first fixating the biceps, fixating it, and then cut. This facilitates uh, the practical work. We think that the result is the same. This is looking at the washer from inside the joint. This is a 70 optics <coughs> and this is a 35 optic as the one we use. So we mark the intraticularly, we place the suture, we place a stitch like the one we saw in the skin and without cutting it, we fixate it in there, even up to one centimeter uh, inside the cartilage. And we use two portals, an anterolateral and a superior, that's how we get in 90 degrees. And once we fixate the tendon, we leave it there. The third group that I said were those associated to, uh, to the rotator cuff. And what we do is that when we have a rotator cuff tear, it's important to go and look at the biceps, not because it might be torn, but sometimes mechanically the structure of the pulley <coughs> is altered and it needs, you need to go and look it and fixate it where it should be. This is the last video, not very clear, sorry. So we place, we prepare the bed, that is the biceps tendon there. We are placing an all, and the, there we see the tear of the rogue tater calf, that's the biceps. We place an anchor. We prefer always to place uh, biodegradable anchors that's our preference, but we know that maybe other anchors can be used. In this case, we place first the anchor because we are going to use the second suture.
to start suturing the rotator cuff and with one of the suture we do the uh, teno, tenoplasty. This is a lipinol. We grab it, we take the suture, and what we are going to do is uh, tie a knot to do the tenoplasty and to come out from the bicipital groove. So the same thing we did from the intraticular perspective we are doing now from the outside. And if you have the suspicion that mechanically the biceps is altered, it would be recommendable to do the tenoplasty. With time, we have seen that many rotator cuffs in revisions have failed because we did, this has not been done. These are the mm -hmm. sutures we use for the biceps. And once it's tied, once it's fixed with the arm, as I said before, in abduction, we cut the suture. And with the scissors, we cut the biceps tendon. Then we burn it. And if there is any proximal remain, we remove it. This is the surgery that we perform in our service. This is what we do now. And thank you very much for your attention. And at the end, it was just tenotomy and tenotomy. Thank you very much. Please and share your screen. OK, thank you. Is there any question, Sergio? Yes. Gaston? Uh, OK. Uh, Dr. Cesar, beautiful presentation. I am a biceps killer. I have a lot of reasons to be a biceps killer. And the thing is, uh, I, I want to make a comment and then uh, a question. When I deal with strong people, strong, I would say amateur, but strong people who go to the gym, and whenever there is a biceps pathology associated, I like to do always a subpectoralis tenodesis, which is, in my opinion, the safest, the safest, not only because uh, you can have a very good function, but because I believe a lot in poly pain, sir, in poly pain. So even sometimes when you do a tenodesis intra-articular, you can have some remaining pain in the poly. Snyder uh, is a strong believer in this, and me too, which is basically impossible to manage. So, so to get out of trouble, which, uh, you should do not only a tenodesis, but a subpectoralis, which is out of the poly. I think that would be very wise, especially in heavy users. Giovanni is uh, doing like this with his head, much probably he agrees with me. So Giovanni and Dr. Cesar, uh, do you ag agree with me? This is a very important message for the juniors in India. Many young uh, people is watching us, and I think that this message should be highlighted as long as you are agree with me first Giovanni and then Dr. Cesar please. Okay. I have just a very very a very very short message in male I perform uh, tenodesis supectoralis uh, opening by the scope the pulley in female because it's very rare that they make the pipe I do tenotomy but I always open the pulley through the scope so the pulley is the key point sure Dr. Cesar Personally speaking, at some point in time, I thought exactly what you thought. I think that the biceps is pretty more loyal than what you think. Um, personally speaking, once you take off the excursion of the pulley, it asks for you to stabilize it. I think that in a suture in the pulley and three weeks on a sling, it could be very good. Sometimes it just cuts alone and it does not retract. Sometimes the tenotomy doesn't retract. So regarding the strength, I do believe when you think about individuals who go to the gym very quickly and after a week they want to start <coughs> working, I agree fully. And even we should place at least two anchors if not a, a bio tenodesis screw, 100% agreed. But the 90% of our patients want just one stitch, just one yes. excuse so that they don't, just give me one excuse that I cannot free myself. It could be one stitch, it could be a harpoon, a suture, or even a bio tenodesis screw. 
there's no difference regarding the excursion when you do tenopolis the excursion uh, is no longer in the groove i mean that gives you the external rotation that makes the biceps do the anti-natural so to speak movement so when you do tenopolis d wherever you do it in the groove that torque movement is lost so conceptually speaking although i agree mechanically speaking the only thing the biceps needs is an arthropathy in any of those places and the mechanical pain of torsion uh, is is gone but i fully agree with the notions let's say thank you very much yes jeff danielle just one quick question when you deal with a weightlifter you're trying to either avoid operating on the biceps to avoid risk but if they have pain from a damaged biceps the disturbance can be within the groove. Sure. My, com my, my comment to the people are, be careful. Weightlifters are just going to stress your repair. But collision athletes are a different animal. And you have to be careful because the size of the hole in the bone and the location of the hole in the bone can become very important. In a collision athlete with a diaphyseal hold because of a interference screw can be a risk factor for, for fracture. fracture and so it's better to be a little bit more superior super pectoralis or groove or even up in the groove may be safer for your collision athlete so that's a little bit different than just a weightlifter and fixation thank you very much jeff Thank you very much all, we are on time. I would like to take the opportunity to salute our friends and colleagues from Europe that are having at this time the European Congress. Uh, we got a like in the announcement of this meeting by Prem Lubiatowski that is uh, the one who is doing the challenging task to organize this meeting in, in the tricky circumstances that we are going through now, but uh, I know that it was a very su successful meeting. Uh, so, Osvandre, your last words, I just want to thank you all, and it was an amazing webinar. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Thanks from our colleagues from the other side of the world, Europe and Asia. Uh, you've been very kind to us. Your, uh, your lectures together with Garcia and, and Ruiz have enlightened our Saturday. And uh, the more we go, uh, it doesn't matter how difficult it is to communicate these days. I can see in the eyes uh, the wish of teaching, of sharing experience, and mainly uh, the wish to be together. Uh, sometime in the future. So this is our spirit and, and our shoulder planet, our shoulder community keeps growing. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Giovanni. Thanks, everyone here. Uh, Gaston, uh, Danielle, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the translator for doing such a wonderful <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and making us sound smart. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Jeff, you're returning that compliment now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Bye -bye. Good day. Bye -bye. Really Bye -bye. Enjoy. Ciao. Pleasure. Ciao, ciao. ciao.